Yeah, thanks for making it work under these extremely hard circumstances. Um, I joined Slack, so people should feel free to ask questions there, even after the lectures or after the watch parties and so on. So, and I'll, I will also upload uh, the result of the lecture there. So, um, maybe I, let me start with a disclaimer. I'm a physicist, so I will try to explain things in a language I think is okay for mathematicians, but if it's not, just stop me and I'll do my best to try to uh, translate uh, to the best of that I can. So um, these lectures will be on um, obtaining a vertex operator algebra inside any four dimensional uh, supergram formal field theory with n equals two supersymmetry or higher. So I'll focus mostly on n equals two, but you can keep in mind that if you have more supersymmetry, just comes along for the ride. And the way I structure these lectures is that in the first lecture, I will basically um, introduce what are these things. So what are uh, four dimensions of profound field series and why uh, do I care with all of this? And also um, how do vertex operator algebras help? So uh, this is a little bit the plan. The first lecture is introducing the players. And then in the second lecture, I will uh, construct a map between four dimensional n equals two STFTs and uh, vertex operator algebras. And then we'll go on in the third lecture to uh, study the properties of this map and uh, the consequences for, for dimensional physics. Okay, so um, let me start with um, introducing n equals to SCFTs. So uh, I'm telling you I'm finding a map between some series in four dimensions. So how, how would you specify a theory? What is a theory? If you're a physicist, uh, typically you start um, by giving some sort of microscopic description in terms of fundamental degrees of freedom. So most commonly you would give uh, a Lagrangian. A Lagrangian description in terms of a gauge theory. So I would say I have some gauge group uh, that can even be some product. And now I have gauge fields. And so I will write the field strengths that transforms in the adjoint of the gauge group. But we have a supersymmetry, so I'm interested in theories with n equals two supersymmetry. So um, each field comes accompanied by super partners. I have n equals two SUSY means I have supercharges. And I'll call them QI and n equals two means that I have two of them and they transform as spinners. So this alpha is a spinner index that can be plus or minus. And I also have a Q tilde alpha dot, which is a conjugate spinner. That, let me call them plus dot and minus dot. And again, I, which is one of two. And these supercharges, uh, if you're familiar with supersymmetry, you know it, they, take you from bosons to fermions and vice versa. So the fact that I'm demanding I have a gauge field, which means I have a field strength that's a boson, it means they will come, these field strengths will come accompanied by um, other, other fields and some will be fermionic. So what I have is the field strengths 
but then I also have to have uh, two wild fermions. Let me call them lambda i. And they are fermions, so they carry a spinner index. And it turns out I also have to have a complex scalar. So altogether, this guy is what is called the vector multiplet. And it must be in the adjoint of the gauge algebra. So this is um, the field strength is a dimension two operator. These guys have dimension three halves and free scalar has dimension one. So these are all three fields as you would normally do to write down a Lagrangian. So this means that they all satisfy the corresponding equations of motion. And I've grouped them together in what is a representation of the conformal algebra and we'll get uh, more into this in a minute. So n equals to Susy requires they come as this package. This is a representation more soon. So if you want to write a gauge theory, then you start by adding vector multiplets. And now you want to add matter to this. So then um, for the Lagrangian, you want to add matter in some representation of G. And again, the matter I want to add should be consistent with n equals to supersymmetry. And so there's, it turns out there's only one type of matter I can add. That is uh, hypermultiplets. So these are, again, they form, it's always the same spirit, supersymmetry relates different operators, bosons and fermions. So I start with a scalar, actually a doublet of scalars. These are scalar. And again, they're free operators. They have dimension one. And then supersymmetry requires that I also have um, two fermions like that, again, of dimension three half. So this is actually a half hypermultiplet. It will, I will demand that it transforms in some representation R of G. And to have the complete thing, I need to add the CPT conjugate in the representation R bar. Of G, so in the conjugate representation, so I uh, doubled this. And note, and we will go a little bit more into this, how short this representation is. So I'm telling you that if I'm searching for representations of the conformal algebra or the superconformal algebra that contain free fields that I can write in my Lagrangian, I find the vector multiplet that has dimension one, three halves, and two. Um, operators, and then I have hypermultiplets that are extremely short. It's an ultra short multiplet. And this is related to um, the fact that all of these operators are conserved. So again, these scalars are conserved and they even obey other uh, shortening conditions. For example, that the supercharges kill this guy here. So these are examples, and we will systematically study what is the representation theory of the n equals to conformal algebra. But here we're finding in examples when we start writing down free fields, 
already examples of particularly short uh, multiplets. So now to write a Lagrangian, you just take these two guys together. You add vectors in a joint of G and then uh, hyper multiplets in representations of G. And you want to, uh, I'm interested in not only supersymmetric series, but also conformal series. So uh, I need to impose conformal invariants. So I should impose that the beta function vanishes. So that I have, um, so this constrained type of method I can add in my Lagrangian. And then it's an exercise in uh, constructing these Lagrangians. The classification has been done. Uh, so this fixes what method you can have. You can classify Lagrangians. Um, reserving both Lucy plus conformal plus then that is also in 2013. And the Lagrangian is completely fixed by symmetry up to the gauge couplings. And these are the things that parameterize the conformal manifold. So they are exactly marginal deformations and you can tune them as you move in the conformal manifold. So um, this would be the typical Lagrangian theory. You write down your Lagrangian, you impose that it obeys everything you want it to obey. Then you have some parameters which parameterize the conformal manifold. It tells how strongly coupled the theory is. You start from a weakly coupled point and then you can crank up the coupling and you can start writing operators in this theory. And operators, as you well know, should be gauge invariant. And they are gauge invariant combinations of the three fields I put in. For example, I can write this guy. Remember, this was the scalar in the hypermultiplet. I told you to transform in some adjoint, sorry, in some representation of the gauge algebra. And then I need the conjugate, another hyper in the conjugate representation. And I contract the indices to make it gauge invariant. And this would be an example of an operator in my theory. And I could try to use Lagrangian to compute uh, correlation functions, which are the observables in my theory. And now if you, however, if you start playing with these theories, 
you soon realize that the landscape of n equals to super formal field series is much more diverse than this. And there exists isolated super formal field series that don't have a conventional dis Lagrangian description in this sense. And you can land on onto them just by just playing, start by playing this game. So let's say I start, I write the Lagrangian in some weekly coupled limit. And now uh, I start computing stuff and I want to increase the coupling. I increase from zero coupling up to some strong coupling value. And then I might find that as I crank up the coupling, I end up in some corner where I have another description, a dual description in terms of another weekly coupled theory. But now the building blocks are no longer these two basic guys I introduced, the free vectors and free hypers, but they are now strongly coupled building blocks that are isolated um, theories and that uh, you, you need to construct the description of the theory you started with, you need to take these isolated strongly coupled building blocks and gauge them to other building blocks or to free hypers and vectors. So then you realize that the landscape is much more rich and diverse and we need to find, well, it's useful to think about this without having to refer to free fields. Okay, so. Um, if there are any questions, um, this is the motivation of why, why we're going to go the way we are. But if there are any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. I don't see any in the chat box yet, but does, does anyone have a question? You can raise your hand also. I had a quick question. So you mentioned, uh, I mean, you're building your theories starting from a Lagrangian. Yes. Uh, and you had this classification of the Lagrangians. Uh, is there, I mean, there are theories that don't necessarily come from a Lagrangian, right? Uh, exactly. No so room. this is um, where I wanted to go exactly now. Great. So uh, what I told you is how you'd go about constructing Lagrangian series. And you might think this is enough. But even if you just start from this Lagrangian series, let's say uh, start from one of these. And now um, increase the coupling. And you will find uh, that in a, what looks like a strong coupling point from the original description, you can actually describe it as, uh, you can find a dual description for it in terms of another weakly coupled theory, but now the building blocks are more, are, are not just free hypers and vectors. So you can find So now you find new non-Lagrangian or let me write just new building blocks. That do not admit a conventional Lagrangian description. So it could be that I started from three vectors plus hypers. And this is a good description of the theory in some region at weak coupling. And now as I increase the coupling, I find a different region that has um, a dual description 
again in terms of weekly of something that is weekly cup of uh, weekly gauging something but now what i'm weekly gauging are not free factors and hypers so now here i will find for example some uh, isolated strongly coupled or isolated is enough it's a series that has no exactly marginal deformations for example gaiotus tn series that has um, flavor symmetry So now you can have various of these isolated building blocks and now you gauge. So the dual description is that you gauge weekly this flavor symmetry. So even if you start just from Lagrangians, there's no way around the need for series that uh, don't have a conventional Lagrangian description in the sense I described. And so, um, then instead of trying to write things in terms of the fundamental fields of the free hypers and vectors and then building everything out of those, I want to uh, avoid having to describe a Lagrangian altogether and just start by telling you the observables. And in the end, my observables, if we go back here, are operators like this, they're gauge invariant. And I don't care about how they were made up. I just care that this guy exists. So then I just describe the theory instead of giving the free fields and then making composites out of them. I just describe the final products. I just describe all operators I can have in my theory and all their correlation functions, which are the observables. So this um, motivation was to justify why. So this motivates us to take uh, an abstract approach. And we describe a theory by giving a list of operators and all their correlation functions. And these are my observables. This is what I can in the end. So I don't need to know how you got this theory it, it can be a lagrangian or it can be one of these uh, new isolated theories in the end all i need to know uh, is this so then you would give me the list for example you tell me that this operator is there in the theory Okay, so uh, this means uh, I now must take very seriously my symmetry algebra and I need to figure out, instead of starting from fundamental building blocks and just building out of there, I just need to take an abstract point of view and list all possible representations of my symmetry algebra. So as Ashwin was uh, saying in his introduction, representation theory plays a very important role here in physics because to take symmetry seriously, I need to know uh, operators must be organized. So they must lie in representations of my symmetry algebra. That's what it means to have uh, the symmetry. So now I need to work out uh, representations. I need to work out the representation theory of the n equals to super conformal algebra. So this might sound like a technical uh, thing that would best be avoided, but it really becomes necessary if you can no longer rely on just building your operators out of um, 
three fundamental fields. So I will quickly start by quickly reviewing the representation theory of just the conformal algebra, and then I will see how uh, supersymmetry organizes this on top. So I will start with a quick summary of conformal algebra and its representations. Okay, so if I'm in Laurentian signature, the conformal algebra is SO4,2. And it would have been um, SO5,1 if I were in Euclidean. And the generators are M in U. So the Lorentz algebra dilatations translations and special conformal transformations. And I copy them down here. So the particular details of the expressions are not very relevant, but just the thing that comes out of it is. So these, these guys, they generate the Lorentz algebra. So this is SO e minus one comma one in um, in Lorentzian signature, and here these etas are uh, the metric on R three comma one. If I mean Lorentzian, or if you want to recrutate, they would be on R four. Uh, and then we see here that. P mu and K mu are Lorentz vectors. All commentators I have not listed uh, vanish. And then we see that P mu and K mu act as uh, lowering and raising operators. or uh, D. So the increase, this is called, D is called the dilatation operator. And uh, P and K increase and decrease the value of D. So now we can build representations just like we would um, build representations for SU2, for example. So we start, uh, we start by diagonalizing the action of the dilatation operator. So we say that we have an operator that obeys. We diagonalize the action and operators have some scaling dimension. So this is what I will call the scaling dimension. And then um, we dimension must be bound from below. So if k reduces the scaling dimension, at some point it must kill the operator, otherwise it would have unbounded dimensions. So at some point, k mu must kill. And this is what this guy becomes called a conformal primary. And now I build my whole representation by acting with momenta, by acting with the translations p mu. So this becomes del mu o and so on. And this increases the dimension. So this guy has dimension delta plus one and so on. So this is what is called, that is what I would as a physicist call a lowest weight state. So I have a lowest weight state of my conformal algebra and then I build the whole representation by acting with momenta. And now I forgot about the Lorentz generators, they commute with the Ds, so they don't change the dimension of the operator, which means that I can just organize these operator in representations of Lorentz. So this guy now is in some representation of Lorentz. And this whole thing together is 
what is called the conformal multiplet. So it's a conformal primary that is killed by the special conformal transformations. And it has some definite weight and it transforms in some representation of the Lorentz um, algebra. And then I build the whole module by acting with P mu with momenta. And acting with momenta is just acting with derivatives. So I just get the whole uh, super conformal, sorry, the whole conformal multiple. And now we want to build super conformal ones. So now to add supersymmetry, I need to uh, consider the n equals two super conformal algebra. So let me write down the algebra. This is two comma two slash two. So this is a least super algebra. And for the mathemat more mathematical oriented, this is just a um, Z2 graded algebra. Um, so, something like this, where uh, for physicists, these are the bosonic generators, this is the bosonic part, bosonic algebra. That is also called even in the math literature, and this is the fermionic or odd. And this algebra comes equipped with a, a bilinear product. So for physicists, these are commutators and anti-commutators that uh, has the property the symmetry, it's either symmetric or anti-symmetric under the exchange of the two things uh, following this. Where I am using the I to say that uh, AI is in GI and BI is, BJ is in GJ. And then here, there's this sign that depends on whether it is. So again, for physicists, this is just saying that uh, if they're both fermionic operators, you have the anti-commutator. And if, they're both, if one of them is bosonic, then you use commutators. And it's just saying. Okay, and this uh, product is consistent with grading. So this is in um, GI plus J mod two. So basically it's G zero if I equals J and G one if I is different from J, and it obeys graded Jacobi identities. So for mathematicians, this is the formal definition of a super Lie algebra. For physicists, um, we have um, fermionic and bosonic generators. And now we have commutators or anti-commutators depending on the type of things you're commuting. So here G0 is a Lie algebra. And having in mind the particular uh, super algebra I want, so n equals two super informal symmetry in four dimensions, G0 is the maximal bosonic subalgebra, which is the conformal algebra in 4D. And then there's an R symmetry. So this here 
is called an R symmetry. So it commutes with the conformal algebra. We will see how it acts on the fermionic generators. And so it's generated by an R plus and R minus and an R. So these are these are two R that I'm writing in a tiny R for the U1. Uh, and the conformal algebra is the one we just had above. So it's generated by P mu, K mu, M mu, mu and D. And then we have the U1 is a, a G0 representation. So these are my fermionic generators. And I'm just saying that they transform in some representation of the bosonic algebra. And so these are my supercharges. And they are fermionic, which means they are also nilpotent. So I already had written before, but let me write it now in complete detail. These are my supercharges where I equals one or two. So this is because N equals two. And then I have another. So these are spinners of Lorentz. So you see that they transform in some representation of uh, my bosonic subalgebra. They are spinners of Lorentz. They have weight a half, and they transform in some representation of SU2R. So SU2R rotates them, and they are charged under U1R. So I wrote here half of the supercharges so far. I need to write two more. These are the ones called the Poincaré supercharges. And then I have two more, which are the conformal supercharges. Okay, uh, maybe let me, I see that there are questions. Maybe I should uh, pause here and answer them before moving on. Sure, yeah. Would you like me to read them out or? Uh, so there's a question on the importance of the square bracket ah, and curly bracket. Okay, so this was just um, kind of a notation to say that I will be using two different um, so let me write this out and this fits nicely with uh, what was going to come. So what this means is that uh, I have this product that depends on its properties. It's either symmetric or anti-symmetric under the exchange of the two things. And it depends on the type of, uh, on the having bosonic or fermionic uh, operators there. So what I will use is basically that it will be a commutator like this. If um, A or B is in G0, so it's bosonic, and it's the anti-commutator, If A and B are in G1, so they're fermionic. So when I'm agnostic, when I don't know what these guys are, I put the square bracket on one side and the curly bracket on the other, just to remind you that you should use one or the other depending on both 
what type of operators you're commuting or anti-commuting. And so then the super algebra that I want to study is this one. This is the one for, for dimensional n equals to super form field series. And the bosonic piece is just the conformal algebra. And then there's something else that is called an R symmetry that was a question about. So the R symmetry is a, it's a bosonic symmetry. It's just an SU2R and U1R. And its significance comes from the fact that the supercharges are charged under it. So they are doublets of SU2R and they are charged under the U1R. So um, now the whole, my whole, uh, so n equals two super conformal algebra is generated by the set of fermionic generators I just wrote, and let me omit the indices, Q, Q tilde, S and S tilde, but also uh, the SU2R, so R plus and R minus, a U and R, and then the conformal algebra that I had written previously. And yes, as uh, Ashwin pointed out, it's important that this SU2R acts trivially, so it commutes the generators in SU2R commute with these ones, and they also commute with ones in U1R, but they act non-trivially on the supercharges because the odd piece, the fermionic piece, transforms as some representation of the bosonic algebra. Okay, so now, uh, I've listed what the algebra is, and I haven't written all the commutation relations. I won't write them all out because I think it's not particularly illuminated, illuminating, but I can uh, give a reference to where they're all written down in all detail. So um, what I want to do now is that I have the algebra and I want to see how operators are organized. And I want to do similarly to what we were doing before. I want to find highest weight states and build whole modules out of it. And since the conformal algebra is a subalgebra here, I want to see how the conformal multiplets we built are now organized fit together in a bigger multiplet that is a representation of the n equals two superformal algebra. So uh, now I want to write, construct representations. Of the n equals to super conformal algebra. And if you write down all the commutation relations, you will see that S and S tilde lower the dimension by a half and Q and Q tilde raise. So again, I will see this as uh, lowering and raising operators when constructing my module. And in particular, because Q and the SNS still the lower the dimension and I want my dimensions to be bounded from below at some point, once again, S must kill my state. So I will be, I'm always using interchangeably a state and operator. And then in a CFT, you have the state operator map so I can, I change, I jump in between talking about local operators and states. And this is just a consequence of the state operator correspondence in CFTs. So that's why I keep changing my words and either talk about local operators or states. So in this piece, I can now say I have a highest weight state or a lowest weight state, depending on your taste. I like to call them lowest weight state. Uh, that is killed by the 
conformal supercharges by the S's, the ones that lower the dimension. And because K uh, is proportion, so K, let me even write it all out. So the anti-commutator of two conformal supercharges is the special conformal transformation, the case. So because if S and S tilde both kill the lowest weight state, then so will K. So this guy that I want to call a super conformal primary is in particular also a conformal primary. And now I want to act with the Qs to build my whole multiplet. So I act with Q and Q tilde. And I get a new state that now has dimension plus a half. So if this guy had dimension delta, This one has dimension delta plus a half, and I can keep going. Because uh, also the commutator of two Qs, so let me write it down. And here I'm swapping between vector indices and dotted indices and you can do that using the sigma matrices so the commutator of two Poincaré supercharges is uh, translation is pmu so acting with all q's i generate also conformal descendants but some of these operators will also be conformal primaries so some combinations in this dot 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 here. Some are conformal primaries. And some are descendants. So you can now organize this whole thing. It will form now a super conformal multiplet instead of just a conformal one. Oops, it didn't work because I didn't close. And it is a sum that is finite. of conformal multiplets. So you can think that if you have a conformal multiplet, that starts with some O, W, O, etc., then you can act with the supercharges to make uh, other, to obtain other conformal multiplets. And you have this finite regrouping and finite because the supercharge is omnipotent. So I don't get to act twice with the same supercharge. So you have a finite regrouping of conformal multiplets in big superconformal multiplets that are my representations. So I'm saying they're my representations, so I need to tell you what labels I should use. So let's look again at what generators we had. I was starting with the conformal, super conformal primary. Just like before, I would like it to have a definite dimension uh, that be an eigenstate of the dilatation operator. It has a definite dimension delta. Can highlight it maybe. And then the dilatation operator commuted with Lorentz. So I had said that this guy should also be in some Lorentz representation. 
but the dilatation operator also commutes with the R symmetries. So they should also be in some representations of the SU2R. And once you know this, once you know the quantum numbers of the superconformal primary, you act with the supercharges and you know the commutation relations of the supercharges and the various generators. So you can work out what representations all of these operators transform in. So the labels now, so a superconformal multiplet. is labeled by uh, the quantum numbers of the superconformal primary. This is the guy killed by S and S tilde. And these are the scaling weight, the dimension, the Lorentz representation that I will use, uh, that will specify as two Lorentz spins. The SU2R representation that I'll call R and D1R charge. And from here, you build the whole multiplet by acting with the supercharges. But now I, not any representation is something I'm interested in for physical reasons. I'm interested in unitary representations. So I'm, I'm studying unitary series. In Laurentian signature. And this requires that all operators have positive norm. So when I'm building this multiplet and I'm starting from some uh, lowest or highest weight state, depending on what you want to call it, that is the superconformal primary. And now I'm building the multiplet by acting with Q and Q tilde. I need to make sure that uh, all of these guys, all of the superconformal descendants, they must have positive norm. So uh, now I'm talking about the norm. So I need, I need to tell you what is the inner product. I need to recall what is the inner product. So I need to give you what is the emission conjugation operation. And in a CFT, we work in radio quantization. So we can quantize our theory in spheres and uh, the admission operation is, uh, let me call it dagger in radio quantization, is such that the conjugate of a Poincare supercharge is a conformal supercharge, like this. And the conjugate of P is K. And so now what I need to work out is that all norms are positive. So if I have some state that I created like this, now I want to compute its inner product with a different state where I use Decker. And this has to give me a positive semi-definite uh, matrix of inner products. So 
So what this results in is uh, what are called unitarity bounds. that tell you typically that the scaling dimension is above some value, let me call it delta B, that is a function of all the other quantum numbers uh, of the primary. So you get uh, inequalities like this that tell you that the scaling dimension of super primary is bounded by some function of all the other quantum numbers. And if the inequality is not saturated, you have what is called a long multiplet. This is a generic multiplet. You just act with the cues and you never encounter any zero or negative norms. You just act as much as you want and you get the whole big multiplet. When uh, the equality is saturated, this is when you get uh, a short multiplet. So the inequality being saturated means at some point in your multiplet, you encounter the null state. So something had zero norm. Below this, you'd get negative norm. At the threshold, you get zero norm. And this means that there's a submodule here. So the representation is reducible and we want a reducible representation. So we're going to throw away the null states. And in the very beginning, we started exactly with an example of this. So when I was writing, uh, for example, uh, the hypermultiplet, and I had something like this, this multiple was very short. It was very short precisely because if you acted with the supercharges, you'd get null states, you'd get zeros. And one such null state is the equation of motion. So these things are related. And these multiples are called short precisely because they are shorter. They have less state than a normal multiple because you cannot act as much as you want. This means that if you act twice with P mu, you get zero. Sorry. Oh. And then uh, finally, something that can happen is, so let me try to draw here a visual picture of this. So we have the dimension of the super primary, and this is enough to label the whole multiple. And we're finding that there's some bound and all operators must be above here. So this is where our long operators are. If you're exactly at the bound, you have what is sometimes, it, it's a short multiple, sometimes these are called semi-short, or it will become clear in a second. And then if you're below, uh, these are non-unitary representations, there are negative norm states. But in supersymmetry, there's an interesting phenomena that there are also representations below at isolated dimensions that are allowed. And these are short or ultra short representations that are the quantum numbers become much more fixed because you really need to fine tune everything, such as there are no uh, no negative norm states, and they're very short because you have many nulls. So the vector and hypermultiplet were actually examples of something like this. All, um, so this is a classification game that you can do. You can now act with the supercharges, you know, the commutation relation. I've told you what's the emission conjugation, so you know what's the inner product on the state. So you can just compute norms or a level by level and figure out uh, 
what are the conditions on the quantum number such that the norms are all positive. This is an exercise one can do. I won't do it in detail. It was um, for the n equals two superformal algebra. It was done long ago by Dolan and Osborne. Back in 02. More recently, it was uh, done again in these and other algebras by Cordova, Dmitryevsky, and Interligator. And one of the references I gave, uh, which were lecture notes by Eberhardt uh, reviews. This. So um, this means that then all unitary representations have been classified. And they are typically labeled by, they are given a name. but it's not particularly illuminated to just give a list of names, but the names typically encode uh, the type of shortening condition. So they tell you what is the null state. So now uh, closing the loop and going back to how I started, now what is a theory? Then if you, I want you to tell me what is a theory, I would like you to tell me what is um, the list of all the operators the theory has, but the, this list organized in super conformal multiplets. So for example, the guy I wrote earlier, and now I don't care how this guy was obtained. I don't need to remember how it was. I don't even need to have three fields to have this operator. I would just say that my theory at this operator, it actually sits in a particular short multiplet. It has uh, dimension two. It transforms as a triplet of SU2R the super primary, so this is a super primary. Um, it's a scalar, it has R equals zero. I can give you a name in these classifications. Uh, so for completeness, I might write it down, but there's no uh, added value in the name in different types of classifications. It's also sometimes called maybe head one. So it has a name, meaning that we know what shortening condition it obeys. So it obeys the condition of this type. Okay, so uh, I think this is a good point to stop where we finished going through a very quick summary of representation theory. And this will be essential in organizing what we mean, what is a theory, I don't need to I don't want to have to rely on being able to give a Lagrangian because many times I just cannot give a conventional Lagrangian description. So instead, I want to study operators by abstractly listing them and seeing their properties and organizing them in representations. And this is what uh, I will start as a definition of a theory next time when constructing this map to two dimensional vertex operator algebras that I will quickly review next time in the beginning. So uh, I can stop here for questions. Great. Thanks a lot, Madalena, for, for a very nice talk. Uh, let's all thank her. And now we can move to uh, the question and answer session. Uh, so maybe we can start with some of the questions that were already posted. I think you address, address some of them, uh, but maybe it would be good to go over, uh, especially for the mathematicians, uh, some of these questions. So uh, there was a question about how are the operators related to supercharges? So I think I'll interpret that as, you know, what are operators, what are supercharges and 
how are they related? And a closely related question was, what do you mean when you say that something is charged under U1, uh, U1R? Uh, so I actually maybe uh, the people can ask the questions themselves. Shrikant, would you like to go first? Did you, you can unmute yourself and if you want to turn on your video and ask the question. Shrikant, are you there? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so I can't start the video if the host has stopped it. Uh, yeah, I can I can change the setting. And yeah, go ahead. Hello. Uh, yeah, so exactly. My question was what uh, Prano had asked. Uh, so uh, what does it mean to say, uh, S, well, I wanted to know what SU sub R, SU to sub R and U1 sub R is. What does it mean to say it's charged gender? Uh, I mean, uh, I mean how, how does it act on Q, basically? Ah, very good. So, um... So maybe I can even answer both questions uh, at once. So I have my super conformal algebra. And uh, then the question, how does it act on Q? You're acting, asking about the commutation relations of um, the R symmetry. So let me actually, I have an SU2R and I have a new one R. And let me absorb it, the one R into it like a big U2, so add the, tra the trace bit. And now this is how it acts on a Q. So this is uh, SU2 plus U1R generator. So if you want the tiny R, would be the trace, or in my conventions, minus four uh, with the trace. And then um, R plus and R minus will be R plus, I'm not make a mistake here. I want two and R to one. And the carta, so this makes the SU2R. And this is the one uh, would be so you see that uh, this Q transforms as a doublet with that index of SU2R, and it has a charge, a definite charge under the U1R that can be inferred from this. So this is the action of, this is the algebra, this is generators on generators. Uh, so maybe uh, let me ask if this answers the question. She can't. She can't, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, okay, now I can unmute, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does. So this capital R subscript is meant to denote the label. So is that right? So that's what it's denoted? Uh, sorry, which capital R? Sub, uh, SU to sub R, when you write a sub R, the... Ah, uh, yes, this because there will be many SU2s lying around. So <laughs> right, the right. R is to remind you that this SU2 is an R symmetry. And our symmetry, as Ashwin pointed out, means that it commutes with the space-time symmetry, but it acts on the supercharges, and it acts on the supercharges like this. Right. And U and R is to remind you there might be many U ones, but this is the one that comes from this R symmetry. Okay. Uh, one one related question: so What is exactly a definition for multiplet? Uh, so these are uh, irreducible representations of the algebra. So this is the definition which means that I would I start from a lowest weight state and then the whole multiplet is uh, I guess the Verma module built by this by acting with my raising operators which are the Q's and I want irreducible ones so if there's an null state I will remove the null state and find my irreducible uh, yeah. 
And this is what I mean by support for all multiple space. So you just full representation of the algebra. Okay, okay. thanks. So I think that also answered, Shoibal, did that also answer your question about? Uh, uh, um, uh, I mean, what is the difference between the SU2 and the U1 that you are calling U1R as a, um, uh, uh, this charge under U1? I mean, I'm not getting that. Uh, here, the difference between this SU2 and this U1? Yeah, why are you saying U1? I mean, you have written the four charges, uh, uh, but uh, uh, why it is U charge under U1R and what, why SU2R is a little different from that? I'm not getting from the things which you have written here. Okay, so yeah, what I wrote here in all fairness, I mean, to be completely, I should have called this a, a U2R because this is not traceless. So I have a U2R and then I want to split off in this U2. Uh, and U1, huh? A U1R. Huh? And then I have an SU2R huh. left over. Yeah, so so then why, 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 why it is charged under U, why are you saying it is charged under U1R and why, 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 what is it, how does it differ, differ from that from SU2R? Ah, okay, very good. So there, uh, it, so it differs by the, so what I can see here is that uh, this QK alpha, this supercharge is a two of SU2R. And it has charge if I take the trace and I only consider a trace, I believe it should have a charge. Uh, okay, maybe minus two because these are not the conventions I'm usually familiar with. Uh, yeah. So, but, so it has a definite charge under the trace bit as well. Okay, 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 yeah, yeah, correct. Thanks, thanks. And then the Q tilde, that if you remember it had the index down, it transforms as the conjugate and it will have the opposite charge under the one R. Okay, thanks. Yeah, okay, okay, thanks. Any other questions? Uh, let me see. If... Please raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, uh, I had put a question in the chat. Did you see that uh, regarding projective representations? So you can ask the question now. Okay, you see, there is a projective representation of a group where, you know, uh, product of elements of the group go to a scalar multiple of modulus one times the products of the represented uh, uh, matrices. So that is a projective representation with certain conditions. So the square curly bracket, which is generalization of uh, uh, um, uh, AB minus BA or AB plus BA, how do they interact? That is um, what, um, uh, what I'm curious about. Um, yeah, you know, so real representations, projective representations, they are all used as you know. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think we only need uh... I'm sorry, I think you're uh, muted. Oh, hang on one moment. Um... Sorry, I, I'm not sure how that happened. Sorry for that. Um, Thank you. Yes. So I, I was saying that um, the symmetry algebra only needs to have a projective action on the Hilbert space. Uh, yes. So um, I think these are type of representations people consider. Regarding the commutators, uh, earlier, I guess you're referring to Sorry to scroll so much. Oh, no, this is much. So here, uh, here I'm just, I think, specifying, uh, maybe I'm missing something, but here I'm just specifying uh, the 
the algebra. So the bilinear product on the algebra. I'm not yet uh, making representations. I'm just saying that I have a Z2 graded algebra. So there's a bit that is even and a bit that is odd. And I have a bilinear product that is my, this product here. Um, that has certain properties depending on whether these guys are even or odd. So I don't think I need uh, to talk about the representations at this stage. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? Please raise your hand. And I had a sort of broad question uh, about, uh, at the beginning you stated this classification in terms of Lagrangians. Um, are you headed towards some classification of theories that are not necessarily Lagrangian, presented by Lagrangian? That would be the dream. So that's like a broad and ambitious goal of many people with many different approaches is to have yes. a complete classification of theories that doesn't rely on Lagrangians. I think what I'll be able to show you is kind of more, much more modest, but it will be, um, so these vertex operator algebras will allow you at least to chart out a little bit the space of allowed series. So you'll see that not anything goes and certain regions of series space are just empty. Right. But the classification, I think uh, that would be the dream and right, maybe right. There is something that can be, um, maybe this is a pass forward, but I think we're not there yet. Yeah. And so is this, what you're talking about, is that in the spirit of the bootstrap program? Uh, that's exactly in the spirit of the bootstrap. It won't be in the numerical incarnation of the bootstrap, but it will be exactly imposing just, yeah, associativity. Mm -hmm. And uh, one more question, maybe at the beginning, you had this conformal manifold, right? So that is, if I understand right, uh, so I'm a mathematician, by the way, so that's why I'm asking all these uh, silly questions. Uh, but if you, if you start with a conformal field theory and look at its marginal deformation, is that what uh, parameterizes locally the thing you're calling the conformal manifold? Yes, exactly. So uh, these gauge couplings I was talking about are exactly marginal deformations. Right. So they preserve conformality. And that's exactly what I'm sorry, the conformal manifold, that's right. So it's like a moduli space of conformal field theories, like a space that parameterizes all conformal field theories of given, uh, you know, fixing some data, background data. Is that right? Is that a sort of rough? Yeah, exactly. So if you have a theory that happens to have um, an exactly marginal deformation and a Lagrangian theory with a gauge coupling is an example of that, if it's conformal, then this, this is a conformal direction. You can, I mean, you can just deform your theory with this exactly marginal operator and you keep conformality and you just explore these manifolds. Mm. That it, I guess it, because of the action of dualities, maybe I shouldn't call it a manifold because there are some special places mm. and so on, yeah. but yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think there is a question. Someone has their hand raised. Uh, Shikant. You have your hand raised. Uh, would you like uh, to? Yeah, yeah. I I had a question about. Uh, so um, so now that the theory which you motivated is like a bunch of operators and like like correlation functions defines a theory. So uh, how does one detect whether such a theory is non-Lagrangian? Like what would be a test for non-Lagrangian? I'm uh, sorry. I mean that there is no Lagrangian specifying this theory. Uh, that's a good question. So. To ask for a Lagrangian, I guess the first thing I would search for is to, does the theory have an exactly marginal deformation? So is that an operator that is exactly marginal? Because this would mean that even if I'm looking at a strongly coupled theory, I could try to go to a point where it becomes weakly coupled. Um, and then I would search for, in this conformal manifold, a point where in my spectrum of operators, in my list of operators, I find three fields. So this would be some, um, a bit of a singular point when the coupling goes to zero, and then I just have collections of three fields. I guess uh, this is the best I can do at trying to attempt to answer 
whether the theory would admit this type of conventional Lagrangian description. There has been progress in constructing different types of Lagrangians, so n equals one Lagrangians that flow under a full RG flow to n equals two series that one would have called non-Lagrangian, but remaining in the realm of just moving on a conformal manifold, I think this is how I would address it. I wouldn't know how to address the question of whether the theory has a less conventional Lagrangian, like some n equals one Lagrangian or something else that we just haven't cooked up yet. So, so the theory, when you say theory, that means uh, it includes all the nearby regions of the parameter variations, not like an individual, not at one point with the individual set of parameters. So because in this answer, we have to tune something and go out and see whether you can find some theory with some free fields, right? In this, in this. Uh, yeah, I guess it would be a bit of semantics here. I guess I would say a theory including uh, if there's an exactly marginal deformation and everything is a function of this parameter and I can yeah. search this parameter space and I would still call it, I suppose, the same theory. Okay. But it's, I guess, my personal semantics choice. I'm not sure if it's so standard. Thanks. So uh, one more question I had about your last slide, you said, you know, where you say what is a theory? Um, uh, yeah. So you included the operators and how they organize into these representations. Uh, isn't the operator product expansion going to be a part of saying what the theory is. So is that what you're going to do next time? So yes, this is what I was going to do next okay. time, yeah. Okay. So then if you just give me a random set of operators, it won't form a consistent theory because now I need to impose uh, that I have a, well, not just unitarity, but I have an associative operator product algebra. So this will be exactly the next step. So in a way, maybe, yeah, let me be more clear. This is uh, more to come. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So any other questions? You can also, uh, even if some question comes to your mind later after the talk, you can always go uh, you know, ask in the Slack, in Slack channel for this particular uh, mini course. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, yeah, and also during the next talk, of course. So since I don't see any hands raised, maybe we can end here for now. Uh, let, first, let's thank Madalena again for a wonderful talk. <laughs>